Hello, and thank you for joining our webinar today. I'm Lucy Gill from Fertance D Solicitors, and I head up the legacies team at the firm. And today I'm talking with my colleague Elizabeth Ware about a case that we've recently concluded in the High Court with Alexander Learmonth of New Square Chambers, which was a dispute over the estate of Lord Templeman deceased. The case started five years ago and culminated in a seven day trial in January this year. Judgment was handed down in favour of our clients last Thursday. You will receive a link to the full judgment of the case if you would like to read it. But today we plan to talk about the background of the case, the issues that were in dispute and the judgment. So I'll now pass over to Lizzie, who's going to set out the facts for you. The case concerned a will dispute relating to the last will of Lord Sidney Templeman. Lord Templeman was an eminent law lord and well-known judge. He presided over several landmark judicial decisions, including cases in our practice area, the field of contentious probate. He most notably coined the term the Golden Rule, which he referred to in the 1975 case of Kenwood and Adams and the 1977 case of Ree Simpson. The Golden Rule is that when a solicitor is instructed to prepare a will for an aged testator or for one who has been seriously ill, he should arrange for a medical practitioner first to satisfy himself as to the capacity and understanding of the testator and to make a record of his examination and findings. Lord Templeman did not follow his own golden rule when he instructed his local solicitor in Exeter to change his will at the age of 88, having lost his wife two months earlier and suffering from some short-term memory loss. A dispute then arose over the validity of Lord Templeman's will, as his son Michael Templeman claimed that his father lacked testamentary capacity to make his last will. By way of background, Lord Templeman had two sons by his first wife Margaret, namely Peter and Michael. In 1996, after Margaret's death, Lord Templeman married his second cousin, Sheila Edworthy. Sheila had been widowed twice before. She had one son, Bruce, with her first husband, Tony Hughes and after Tony's death she married John Edworthy. John was the father of Jane Goscustard and Sarah Edworthy, our clients. Jane and Sarah therefore became Sheila's stepdaughters, but they referred to Sheila as their mother and they were essentially treated as her daughters. After Sheila married Sydney, Sydney became close to Jane and Sarah and they became like daughters too. When Sheila was married to John Edworthy, they built a property in the 70s in a paddock in Exeter and they called it Mellowstone. When Sydney and Sheila married in 1996, Sydney sold his home in Woking and moved into Mellowstone with Sheila, with two thirds of the sale proceeds of his property passing to Michael and Peter. Sheila's son Bruce was severely disabled. He owned a property in Rock in Cornwall known as Rock Bottom. When Bruce passed away in 2004, he left his property in Rock to Sheila. Sheila entered to a deed of variation to vary the gift of Rock Bottom so that it passed to Jane and Sarah and Jane's daughter Grace. Possibly in light of this gift, Sheila made a new will in 2004, providing that Mellowstone should pass to Sydney on her death. And if Sydney predeceased her, she wanted Mellowstone, which she valued at £400,000, to pass after inheritance tax as to £120,000 to Sydney's six grandchildren, and £120,000 would pass as to a 35% 35, 35 share to David Templeman, her nephew, a 20% share to her friend Christopher Blasdale, and 15% to each of Jane, Sarah and Grace. Sydney made a 2004 codicil to his 2001 will providing for the same for Mellowstone. Sheila's solicitor queried her decision because if Mellowstone sold for more than £400,000, any surplus would go to Michael and Peter, Sydney's sons. Sheila was adamant that Sydney could do as he pleased with Mellowstone after she passed away, and that both sets of family had been adequately provided for by Sheila and Sydney. Sheila passed away in June 2008, and Sydney inherited Mellowstone. In August 2008, Sydney made a new will with his solicitor, providing that Mellowstone and its contents should pass to Jane and Sarah. He gave reasoning to his solicitor, which was recorded in an attendance note, that he felt it was their family home. The solicitor commented that his logic seemed faultless. Sydney continued to live in Mellowstone and made a number of generous gifts to his family, including over £200,000 to each of Michael and Peter and £20,000 to each of his grandchildren. 
He recorded these gifts, made in 2009 and 2011, by a gifting note, which also recorded that Mellowstone was passing to Jane and Sarah in accordance with his will. Sidney died in June 2014. He had appointed his son's wives to be his executors, namely Leslie and Anne. Anne subsequently renounced her role, and Leslie wrote to Jane and Sarah, informing them that the 2008 will was invalid, and suggesting that they accept that the estate pass in accordance with Sidney's 2001 will and 2004 codicil, meaning they would each receive a 15% share of £120,000 rather than Mellowstone outright. Fertansi were instructed in 2015. We engaged in correspondence to resolve the matter. However, it was not possible, and we issued proceedings to prove the 2008 will. The Templemans applied for summary judgment, but they were not able to convince the court that our clients did not have a case with a reasonable prospect of success, as there were too many tribal issues on the evidence. The matter therefore went to trial in January this year and lasted for seven days. Lucy will now give a bit more detail about the dispute. Thank you, Lizzie. So, during the course of the trial, the judge heard evidence from six witnesses, which include, included our two clients, Jane and Sarah, Lord Templeman's stepdaughters, one of his sons, Michael Templeman, the other one did not want to be involved in the dispute, Michael's wife, Leslie, the appointed executor, Eileen Turnham, the deceased's only surviving sibling, who was 94 herself, and John Goss Custard, Jane's husband, who desisted Lord Templeman with his administrative matters in later years. The court also had the benefit of hearing from a medical expert, Professor Howard. David Merrick, the will drafting solicitor, was unable to give evidence as he had suffered PTSD after a boating accident and was subsequently struck off the role of solicitors for dishonest behaviour. This post dated the will he made for Sidney Templeman. His will file was in evidence and a statement of his recollections was submitted as hearsay evidence by his wife, also a solicitor, Chris Nichols. The other evidence provided was briefly as follows. Jane and Sarah saw Sidney Templeman frequently at the time of his last will. Jane and John lived close by and would have him to stay two or three times a week to keep him company. They also ensured his fridge was stocked with food and generally helped out. Sarah saw him frequently and would often take him to hers in Wales or on holiday at the family holiday home in Rock, Cornwall. They described a close and loving relationship with Sidney Templeman. Sidney had gone to stay with Sarah immediately before he made his 2008 will and had asked her who owned Mellowstone. She said it was more like he was mulling it over. He had papers in his hand at the time. After she reminded him that he owned Mellowstone, he said, that's not right. He promptly got in touch with his solicitor and made his 2008 will. Two months later, Michael Templeman inquired with his father on a visit to see him whether he'd made a will since his wife died, to, to which he responded no. Michael and his wife found Sidney's earlier codicil from 2004 in his study and wrote to Cross and Cross, the family solicitors, to ask if there was a later will. In response, and with Sidney's permission, Leslie received a copy of the 2008 will from Cross and Cross, and Michael and Leslie promptly made a trip back to see Sidney to show him. In the witness box, they recounted the visit when they showed him the 2008 will and the earlier 2004 codicil and asked him what the difference was. He was unable to respond. They explained the differences to him, to which he responded, this must be put right. Early the following year, Sidney made substantial lifetime gifts, including £120,000 to his children, which mirrored the gifts he removed from the 2004 will, and £100,000 each to Michael and his brother Peter. He never made a further will. Leslie and Michael said that Sidney was so forgetful that he'd forgotten the will he and Sheila made in 2004 and the reasons why. Their case hinged on the fact that Sidney had made the 2008 will in error, writing a non-existent wrong, in their words. They referred throughout this case to this being a illusory belief. Michael and Leslie said there was examples of Sidney's bad memory, which included being unable to use the Sky TV remote, driving on the wrong side of the road in Portugal, forgetting to buy a notepad to leave by the phone as an aid memoir, and forgetting repeatedly that he paid his taxes and on one occasion paying them twice. Eileen, Sidney's sister, gave evidence that Sidney was capable of living independently and when he came to see her, which involved travelling there and back on a train, he played Scrabble with their sister Olive and beat her, which was significant as she was a Scrabble legend and usually unbeatable. 
Professor Howard gave expert evidence that Sidney did have early onset Alzheimer's at the time he made the 2008 will, and it likely affected his episodic memory. That is the memory that enables you to recall events. His working memory, however, was intact, and that was the ability to take in information, hold it online for long enough to complete a task or make a decision. Being able to play Scrabble was a very useful clue that his working memory was intact. Further advanced Alzheimer's patients would not even have been able to attempt Scrabble. The Templemans did not call a medical expert. The only issue for the trial judge was whether or not Sydney had testamentary capacity to make the 2008 will, and that required consideration of the well-known test in the old case of Banks and Goodfellow, which was that Lord Templeman was capable of understanding the nature of making a will and its effects, understanding the nature and extent of his estate and the property he was disposing of, knowing the claims he ought to give consideration to, and was not suffering from any disorder of the mind that perverted his sense of right or prevented the exercise of his natural faculties in disposing of his property by will. It was accepted by the Templemans that the only limb in dispute was the last limb, whether he knew the claims he ought to give effect to. Leslie and Michael said there was no rational explanation for Sydney's 2008 will. They said nothing had changed from 2004 to explain why he would make a different decision as to what should happen to Mellowstone in 2008. They said the comment that David Merrick had recorded in his attendance note that his thinking was flawless because he wanted to give Mellowstone to Jane and Sarah because it was their home was irrational. They said it could be inferred that Sidney had forgotten the 2004 arrangements and was acting under an illusory belief that his will did not provide for the eventuality that he would inherit Mellowstone. That illusory belief provided a false premise that leaving Mellowstone to Jane and Sarah was the fair thing to do because it was their home, having forgotten that he'd already decided with Sheila what to do with Mellowstone. Michael and Leslie say that Sidney did not appreciate the relative nature and extent of the calls upon his bounty from his family and from Sheila's family, the beneficiaries under the 2004 will, and therefore he lacked capacity. So the judge had to determine how much a testator needs to know about their previous wills and gifts in order to satisfy that limb in the Banks and Goodfellow test, that they appreciate the nature and extent of calls upon their bounty. The Templeman said, in line in line with that, that Sidney needed to have appreciated all of those beneficiaries he'd included and excluded. And in order to do that, he would have needed to remember the terms of the 2004 codicil and the fact that he was leaving his grandchildren and Sheila's other ben residuary beneficiaries out. There were a number of other points they also used to support their case. The will drafting solicitor's attendance note was lacking. David Merrick from Cross and Cross comments on Sydney's short-term memory loss not being as good as it once was, and he described the house as Jane and Sarah's family home, but he did not specifically refer to his previous will and codicil in the attendance note. David commented that he considered Sydney's logic was faultless, but the Templemans contend it could only have been faultless if Sydney knew of the 2004 codicil. There were typographical errors in the will, including the wrong spelling of family names. And the will appointed Anne as a co-executor, Peter Templeman's wife, when all of Sydney's previous wills had only appointed Leslie Templeman. And he would use the pecuniary legacies from £5,000 each to £500 each with no explanation. So the judge had to consider two questions. The first was a factual question. Had Sydney forgotten the terms of his previous will and codicil? And the second was a legal question. If Sydney had forgotten the terms of his previous will and codicil, did this make the 2008 will invalid for lack of testamentary capacity? Our case was very much that Sydney had not forgotten his previous will and codicil. He simply changed his mind based on the evolving relationship with Jane and Sarah between 2004 and 2008. But even if he had forgotten the 2004 will, it was not critical, as there is no requirement to remember earlier testamentary documents or wishes. And I'll now pass over to Lizzie, who's going to talk through the main aspects of the judgment that was handed down last week. The judge's factual finding was that Sidney had not forgotten he'd previously made a codicil in 2004. He made this finding having heard evidence from the witnesses, evidence from the medical expert, and details of the will drafter's attendance notes. 
he found that there was no evidence that Sidney's mental functioning was impaired to a significant degree in 2008, apart from some issues with his episodic memory, which is the ability to recall recent events. The evidence showed that Sidney was able to recall distant events, such as his time at Cambridge as a student, and that also his working memory, i.e. his ability to retain information and hold it online and make a decision, was functioning. In addition, his considerate pre-morbid intellect helped him. The evidence showed that he was able to retain things in his mind whilst they were subject of a discussion or whilst reading information. His main issue was recalling more recent events. He could remember more significant events, such as remembering that he'd arranged an appointment with the will drafter David Merrick, and keeping this appointment, which nobody helped him arrange. But more trivial, event, more trivial events were forgotten, such as being asked to put a pad of paper and pen by the telephone, or how to use the remote control. With this in mind, the judge found it highly likely that Sidney would have remembered he made a codicil in 2004, as this was four years before he made his 2008 will, and at a time when he did not have any issues with his memory. The evidence showed that his memory issue started in 2006. Professor Howard gave evidence, saying that when you bank a memory at a time when your mental faculties are intact, you are more likely to be able to draw on that later down the line. If, however, you bank a memory when your mental functioning is impaired, it is often not stored as well and therefore not as easy to draw on again. The judge found that while Sidney may not have remembered the precise details of his codicil in 2004, he would have been able to find it out and would have likely remembered it existed. In addition, on cross-examination, both Michael and his wife Leslie agreed that Sidney's 2001 will and 2004 codicil were easily located in his study. And the judge commented that due to Sidney's job, he likely considered his will from time to time. And in fact, the witness evidence from Jane's husband, John, also confirmed that Sidney often did this. The judge therefore said that he would have been able to find out the information about his will quite easily. In addition, Sarah said in her evidence that she had a conversation with Sidney in August 2008, before he made his will, where Sidney asked Sarah who owned Mellowstone. And when she advised him that he owned Mellowstone, Sidney said this must be put right. Michael and Leslie said this was evidence that Sidney had forgotten his previous will and codicil. However, the judge found that this was not a strange thing for Sidney to ask, and that Sidney was probably just asking Sarah for confirmation. The judge went one step further and found that Sidney had exp expressed an emotional feeling and had changed his feeling about where he wanted Mellowstone to go. The Templemans made a point about how nothing had changed between 2004 and 2008, and how Mellowstone was no more Jane and Sarah's home in 2008 than it was in 2004. The judge commented that this overlooked the emotional journey that Jane and Sarah and Sheila and Sidney had been on for those four years. They had spent a lot of time together, and it was clear that Jane and Sarah provided a lot of love and support in those four years. The judge criticised the Templemans' over-analytical approach, and said it overlooked emotional feeling. In terms of the will drafting solicitor's attendance note, the judge did comment that this was lacking, given that the will drafter had not referred to Sidney's previous wills. However, he did not criticise the will drafter for not following the golden rule. It was clear that the will drafter had considered capacity, having referred to Sidney's short-term memory loss in his attendance note, and that he had easily dismissed this as not being an issue. However, the judge did comment that following the golden rule could have avoided litigation. The judge commented that even if he had found that Sidney had forgotten his previous testamentary dispositions, he still would have found him to have testamentary capacity. This is because comprehension and appreciation of the calls on a testator's bounty does not require actual knowledge of other gifts that have been made or the financial circumstances of a potential object. A testator does not have to have all the facts with which to make a correct or justifiable decision. He has to have the capacity to decide for himself between completing claims. That means that he must have the ability to inform himself about those claims to the extent that he wishes to do so, but not that he must remember the relevant facts about each of the potential objects or have correctly understood their financial circumstances. He just needs the capacity to weigh the rival claims. 
The judge rejected the notion that a will cannot be valid unless the testator is aware of the terms of his existing or previous wills, or has to mind the reasons underlying the gifts in them. A testator does not have to justify to himself a difference between a previous will and a new will, even if there were particular reasons for the terms of the previous will. In addition, the judge also found there was no evidence of a delusion which led to a lack of testamentary capacity. The Templemans relied on the 1929 case of Re Bellis on the basis that Sidney incorrectly believed there was a wrong that needed to be put right, i.e. that he did not remember that he already had a will that dealt with Mellowstone as agreed with Sheila. Michael and Leslie said that in October 2008, two months after Sidney made the will, they showed Sidney his previous codicil and his new will and compared them. Michael said his father was confused and said this must be put right. Michael took this as meaning Sidney had made the 2008 will forgetting the terms of his previous will and forgetting he'd already dealt with Mellowstone. Michael's case was therefore that the 2008 will was putting right a non-existent wrong caused by an illusory belief due to his forgetfulness, which was underpinned by a delusion, therefore meaning Sidney lacked testamentary capacity. The judge struggled with this concept. He said it was clear to him that Sidney's thinking in 2008 was what he wanted to happen to Mellowstone and what he felt was the right thing to do. Even if he had forgotten what he agreed with Sheila, this was not a delusion which meant he lacked testamentary cap capacity. It was clear from the evidence that Sidney was capable of processing information and making decisions even if he needed to be presented with the information. A delusion, however, is when you cannot be convinced of something even when you're reassured. The evidence showed that Sidney could be reassured when presented with information, for example when he was concerned about his tax returns not being completed. The judge therefore held that even if Sidney forgot his previous testamentary disposition, this fell short of a delusion and was merely a failure of memory about previous intentions. The judge rejected that a mere mistaken belief, which is the product of forgetfulness, is inimical to testamentary capacity. Put simply, if Sidney had forgotten his previous testamentary dispositions when he made his 2008 will, that was a simple mistake attributable, attributable to his poor memory and not to any mental illness or fixed belief, so he therefore satisfied that test in Banks and Goodfellow. So overall, uh, judgment in our favour. Thanks, Lizzie. And um, for everyone listening to this, obviously, we're not doing it live. So unfortunately, we can't take questions. But um, we both are really happy to take questions if anyone does want to contact us um, afterwards. And we'll make sure that via ILM, we share our contact details um, for anyone that doesn't have them. And as I say, we'll also share a full copy of the judgment um, and uh, really happy to talk about it. But thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Fatansty, powering your ambition.